how delighted I am and we are working with the ASPA uh, in this series of presentations. You'll hear more about that from Debbie in just a moment. And simply to ask Debbie Dillon to come to the podium or maybe just where you are and, and do the introductions. Um, your choice, Debbie. Uh, and I'm also asked by the school to make a plug. You'll notice uh, we have an announcement of an upcoming community redevelopment discussion being sponsored by the Salt Price School of Public Policy also on February 29th, which is related to this shifting the burden discussion in the, uh, in the area of redevelopment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Debbie to moderate, lead the panel, and take us through the day. Debbie, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, and welcome all of you on behalf of ASPA, the Southern California chapter, which is, uh, stands for American Society of Public Administrators. Um, I'm the current president, and I'm very pleased to have developed this partnership with the Bedrosian Center. This is our fourth event that we've done with them in the last couple of years, and we plan to continue to build on these. And this one is a kind of a teaser session to continue working on this concept. It came about through discussions and planning this event. Um, we started to talk about finance, since it's a, a, a hot topic for many of us, both personally and professionally, and what could we talk about finance? And as we got into those discussions, it really became more of a conversation about shifting costs and shifting responsibilities and not necessarily getting any funding to take care of those responsibilities. And so we came up with the term shifting the burden. And so we're here today with a very esteemed and uh, diverse panel to talk about a number of subjects with you for just a little bit to pique your interest. And then we will have some follow-up sessions in the fall and the spring of next year to delve deeper into each of these topics. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce you today, and I'm going to ask each of them to tell you a little bit about themselves before we get started. Um, the first is Dean Mazinski. He's an adjunct policy fellow at PPIC. Uh, thank you. This morning, out of curiosity, I looked up the word adjunct, as in adjunct fellow. It means non-essential. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I work mostly in Sacramento uh, for the Senate, uh, for several governors, uh, as the head of the California Research Bureau. Uh, and uh, I, while working for the Senate, I wrote uh, uh, some legislation you may have heard of, including the uh, Melarus Community Facilities Act and something called the Infrastructure Financing District Act, which uh, has hardly been used for 20 years, but uh, is now of great interest because it's redevelopment without tax increment, or with your own tax increment, more precisely, uh, and is of interest. Thank you. Thank you, and then we have next to Dean, um, Laura Farinella, Deputy Chief at Long Beach Police Department. Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Laura Farinella. I'm a Deputy Chief with the Long Beach Police Department been in law enforcement and specifically in Long Beach for over 21 years. I'm currently the deputy chief over our support bureau. We have four bureaus and under my command is jail, is our 911 communication center, and then all Homeland Security, which would be port, airport, transit, and the airport. I think I said that, yeah, port, airport, transit, and our training academy and firearms range. So those are the uh, disciplines and the specifics that are underneath my command. Good morning, or afternoon, I guess. Thank you, Laura. Next to Laura, we have Vincent Holmes, who is a principal analyst with the LA County CEO Service Integration Unit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is, again, Vincent Holmes with the Chief Executive Office, LA County. And um, my responsibilities include um, the development of juvenile justice um, issues for Los Angeles County um, with an emphasis on um, gang violence um, and, and, and similar, similar issues. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you. And then we have Daniel Jordan with the Director of Finance, City of La Cunada, Flint Ridge. Thank you, Debbie. Um, you know something about that city because you actually pronounced it correctly, so <laughs> good for you. Um, she said, I am the, the uh, that small city's Director of Finance um, since 2003 as, as well. I have been uh, one of those non-essential, aka adjunct professors here at USC uh, teaching public financial management and budgeting. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I think we're gonna have an interesting discussion. Thank you. And then last but certainly not least, we have Stephen R. Harding, who's a senior consultant with Cosmont Companies and also the current city manager of Harupa Valley. 
Well, hi, I'm Steve Harding, and I'm a recovering city manager. I'm about <laughs> four steps through the 12-step program right now. Um, check with me next week. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of really being the city manager of the newest city in the state, probably the newest city in the, uh, in the nation, the city of Arupa Valley, uh, which we're going to talk about. Hopefully I can get all this in here in the 10-minute period of time we have. Um, I've uh, been a consultant in over 40 municipalities in the state of California. Uh, a lot of it was redevelopment. I've been a city manager in four cities and obviously a, a a senior consultant with Cosmod. So I've been tasked with the duty of discussing both redevelopment and the effects of SB 89. So I look forward to it. Thank you. And just to help us a little bit up here, it'd be great just to take a couple minutes if you could raise your hand if you're a student so we know who's in our audience. Welcome students. And who are professors or in academia? And then uh, professionals, working professionals? All right, so we have a pretty good mix here today. Welcome. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Sorry, someone's being funny, but I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear it. They're, um, they're grousing because you have at least three elected officials Oh, here. I'm sorry. <laughs> All from Arupa Valley. They wanted to make sure. I said I wasn't going to be there today. They said, sure. How many elected officials do we have today? All right. Wow, great. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate you all being here. And so we're going to get started and, and go through the order in which we introduced folks. And Dean's going to give us some context and background around the concept of shifting the burden. Since it isn't a new concept, it just seems to be more prevalent than ever right now. So, Dean. Um, in Sacramento budget speak, uh, shifting uh, functions is called realignment. And so I'm going to talk to you about realignment. Um, the core idea of realignment is that it's sometimes a good idea to shift functions to, from higher levels of government to more local levels of government, uh, to shift authority, flexibility, and money. This is a very old idea. Uh, you can, you could you can understand the American Civil War as being about realignment. The South proposed uh, an alternative uh, set of authorities that should go to the states. The North disagreed. Uh, in California, well, uh, one step further. Um, realignment in its modern format uh, is probably started with President Reagan. Uh, most of you are far too young to remember, but he talked about <laughs> the idea of devolving uh, functions from the federal government to the state, giving uh, the states uh, increased flexibility to run things like social programs. And uh, since the states would have flexibility and could obviously accomplish more with less, cutting federal funding to the states. Uh, this uh, is something that you can understand either as extremely good logical public policy or as a cheap trick to justify cutting funding to the states and to the local localities. That little bit of ambiguity is inherent in almost all realignment discussions, uh, as you'll see. Um, realignment in California uh, goes back to 1991, when uh, it was a year of recession, uh, call it the Pete Wilson recession, uh, the state budget was in chaos. Uh, it was one of the first of the real serious chaoses. And uh, uh, many programs were being cut, in particular mental health. So an idea was proposed. Uh, it went like this. We would ask the voters to increase the sales tax. We would increase the vehicle license fee. Uh, we, if we did that, uh, the rules in California are that if you have new revenue going into the state general fund, 45% uh, of that revenue has to go to schools. That's Prop 98. So we'd increase all these taxes and a lot of the money would go to schools. The genius of realignment was, oh no, this new money isn't going into the general fund. It's going into a new special fund and will immediately go out to the locals, never passing through the state except as a collection agency, hence not subject to Prop 98. All of the money goes to mental health and uh, a few other social programs at the time. Now, although it was called realignment with a capital R, 
uh, there was very little increase in local authority or local flexibility. Realignment in 1991, as far as I'm concerned, was all about a financial maneuver to avoid Prop 98. Um, and that's what happened. In 2011, Governor Brown proposed almost exactly the same transaction. If it was good enough for Pete Wilson, it ought to have been good enough for the Republicans in the legislature in 2011. Remember, he proposed increasing, well, not increasing, extending an increase in the sales tax, extending an increase in the VLF, putting all that money into a special fund to go out to locals not subject to Prop 98. Same deal. The Republicans were different, and uh, they didn't buy it. Now, <clears throat> there was one part of realignment 2011 that was real realignment, and that's corrections, where instead of just talking about flexibility, the state actually is shifting some 30,000 prisoners who would have been in state prison to localities. That's a very, very big deal. Um, but the rest of the 2011 realignment was just a financial transaction. Now, I, I'd like to um, more or less conclude, we're only supposed to talk for a few minutes, with uh, five um, ideas about realignment. Uh, one is that the philosophical core of realignment, as it's talked about in state budgets, is uh, to, to put governmental authority and functions and money at the level of government where uh, the program can most effectively be run. That's an important thing to do. It's very difficult. It's complicated because there are all these trade-offs. If you care about statewide equity, you probably go for the state. If you care about running programs in a way that reflect local priorities, you, care, you prefer to devolve down to the local level. That's one really important trade-off. There are a bunch of them. And the fact is, uh, in an analytical, objective way, we know almost nothing about what the ideal level of government for running this program or that program is. So this is almost entirely uh, uh, a policy discussion cast in tones of high rhetoric with little substance. That's one. Two is realignment in California has so far, with the exception of corrections, been almost entirely about avoiding Prop 98 avoiding the requirement that 45% of the money go to schools. Whether that's constitutional is highly debatable and not yet tested in court. The 1991 realignment had a poison pill. If the schools won a challenge on Prop 98 ground, the entire tax blew up, so there was no revenue for the schools to get. That's not the case now, and there is a new court case moving forward on testing the Prop 98 viability of 2011 realignment. Um, a third point is correctional realignment is completely different. It's a really big deal. It's the biggest change in correctional policy in California in four or five decades at least. Uh, it has its own constitutional problem. You may recall that the California Constitution also says if the state mandates that locals do something new, the state has to reimburse them for the costs they incur in doing that new thing. Arguably, the uh, realignment of 30,000 prisoners to local jurisdiction is a, a mandate. Uh, arguably, the amount that the state has given locals to pay for this is not enough to reimburse them for their actual costs. That's also something that will be tested in the court. Uh, a fourth point is the governor has proposed uh, a, a uh, constitutional amendment to guarantee local realignment funding. It does that. It also says the Prop 98 issue and the, the state mandate issue go away. They're not constitutional violations. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the fifth point is that the realignment is uh, uh, a conversation that's been going on in state budgetary circles for 20 years. It's very big in the ledge analyst's office. It's very big in the Department of Finance. Right now, it's very big in the governor's office. It's going to be with us for a long time. 
So uh, although it's kind of a new idea and new rhetoric, I suggest you invest a little bit in learning about it. Thank you. Just one quick thing before Laura gets started. I forgot to mention that we will conclude, we plan to finish our discussion around one o'clock and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So thank you. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon again. Um, what I'm gonna talk about uh, re real briefly is the impact on law enforcement and to our local communities. And I'll specifically talk about Long Beach because obviously that's what I'm most familiar with. There's two, um, I guess what you call realignments or shifting of the burdens that are impacting us. And one is AB 109, which is considered prisoner realignment, and the other is the elimination of redevelopment, both of which severely impact cities such as Long Beach that are very dense, highly populated, and have a diverse community. And the first of is AB 109, and I'll kind of nail that down for you a little bit more, and I apologize if you already know what I'm talking about. Um, but to give you a little background, the prisons are overcrowded, and um, there was a study that was done that basically said that the prisoners in our local state system were not given adequate, um, basically, medical care and the basic needs that a prisoner needs be due to the overcrowding um, situation. And so one of the ways to fix that was to move, in the next two years, 30,000 prisoners from the state federal system down to the county system, which ultimately come, they go back to in which the counties and cities from which they came. And we have basically two years for this to happen, and it was supposed to start October of last year. And I'm not going to tell you that I know the impacts today, because I don't. All I do know is that we have to be prepared for this happening, and it's happening today. And how are we going to work with our um, county partners and faith-based partners and community-based partners to help these prisoners when they come back out, when we expect them to be behind bars? Um, that's going to be problematic for us all. And, and the way they've kind of laid it out, or the legislation has kind of laid it out, is the way we'll, we'll pick and choose which prisoners are more, most ripe for this opportunity with their non-sex, non-violent, and non-serious offenders. However, that takes no consideration for their previous record, unless it involves children. That becomes very problematic for us as police officers. Um, and I'll give you a scenario. You, we arrested someone for a stolen vehicle, non-serious, non-violent, non-sex. However, they have a huge career criminal, career criminal past that is not considered, that maybe involves rape, it involves a shooting, it involves an attempted murder that they've already done time for. Because this current case that they are now sentenced to, back to the county level, and then maybe out, um, off out of, um, that's another thing, is they can be on supervised um, probation outside of the confines of a jail when they would normally otherwise be in the prison system. So I'm not sure if that's really the best way to, to, to go about it. I'm not gonna say I have the right answer, but that becomes very problematic for us. When we arrest people for these crimes and we know that they are a recidivist offender and have a propensity for violence, we have that reassurance under the old system that they will be incarcerated for a period of time, that they were not back out on the streets committing crime. And while they were incarcerated, they were receiving some sort of wraparound services as far as social, they were receiving some medical care, obviously getting fed and had a place to sleep. Um, a lot of these people, 67 to 70% of the in individuals we're talking about are recidivists, which is, takes up about 10% of our communities. So these are the repeat offenders that we're talking about. And so when they come back to the counties and the communities from which they came, they're gonna go back there because that's where they have their network, whether it's functional or not. Most likely it's dysfunctional. Their, their literacy levels are low. Um, their family connectivity is very dysfunctional and they're usually addicted to either drugs and are uh, chemical dependent on alcohol or some, something else. So with that combination, it's kind of like a firestorm for how do, we, how do we put a Band-Aid on this? How do we identify the worst of the worst that are coming back to our counties and our communities that we can provide wraparound services for? And I'm gonna blend in something else with that. We used to be 1,020 police officers in 2009. As of today, we are 825. And it might not seem like a lot, but we currently have six police officers dedicated to providing wraparound services to identified 40 people for each officer that are being re-entered back into the community in an effort to make them positive, good working citizens. Um, hooking them up with social services, with goodwill to get a job, with a place to find clothing, um, mentorship through other community-based organizations because their family didn't provide it. And it might not seem like a lot to you, six bodies, but six police officers out of the 500 and 852 that are not on the street answering calls for service adds up over time. And not that it's not a great um, 
effort and working with our community, it is. But as you see, as police officers, it's just not answering call to call to call to call. We're now becoming the priest. We're now becoming the doctor. We're now becoming the social servant. We're now becoming the mentor and the mother, the father to people that didn't have that. And our job has really opened up and spread further. So that becomes very problematic for us. Um, and another thing I'll touch on too is that um, in law enforcement, we look, at the, we look at the crime triangle. And each point of the triangle um, represents something like the suspect, the victim, and the location. And if you take away one of those points on the triangle, you basically eliminate the opportunity for crime to be committed. And with this realignment and more um, prisoners coming back on the street, you're not taking away one of those prongs. And then when I talk about redevelopment and the inability to renew and breathe life back into communities that normally wouldn't have it with new buildings and um, parks, skate parks for kids to play at, which don't normally have any kind of yards whatsoever, apartment buildings that are fresh and new, um, you take that ability, you take away the environment, the location. You know when you walk, drive into a community, there's graffiti, dilapidated buildings, things aren't kept up, shoes, shoes on uh, wires ahead, trash in the street. You know already no one cares about that community or there's a perception that there's no, no one cares about that community. And this is a place where I can go commit crime and I can do what I can do because nobody cares. Redevelopment changes that for those communities and it has in our city. I've seen it time and time again. I came on in 1989, and when I drove down the street, it was kind of a sad state of affairs. And now I drive down those streets, and I see new faces. I see skate parks. I see kids. I see schools that have fresh paint on them, new buildings. And they're all meant to not change um, the demographic of that community, but they're meant to breathe new life into it and give those people a sense of you can live here on a modified um, rent or income, but we are going to make it good. We're going to make it new for you. and. Um, if redevelopment impacts us, which it's going to, we're losing 48 positions in the city of Long Beach that was dedicated to that effort um, with the realignment and more people coming out and then um, not having the ability to refresh and renew our challenged areas through new buildings and opportunities, it becomes very problematic for us. And then you add in the reduced number of police officers on the street, um, it becomes very overtaxing. And that's kind of what we're seeing in law enforcement. We don't have an answer to it, but I can rest assured yeah, let you know that we are working with our partners federally, locally, and uh, community-based to try to find um, some sort of map of how we're going to deal with this for the future. Thank you, Laura. And now Vincent wants to share with us some of his experiences from the county perspective. Right, and I'm, I'm gonna try to paint um, um, a little positive picture of realignment um, as much as I think as is realistically possible. Um, again, my name is Vincent Holmes and I work for the LA County Chief Executive Office. And for those of you not too familiar with the County of Los Angeles, um, but um, within the County of Los Angeles there are roughly 33 county departments. Um, and, and the areas that I work with are mostly ju juvenile justice issues or criminal justice issues in general. Um, so. I have probably seen, uh, or, or certainly the departments that I work with have seen um, some of the biggest issues that, um, that, that realignment has, has faced for local, for local um, agencies, particularly as it relates to public safety issues. Um, you know, I, there's, a, there's a slight good spin I'd like to put on this, if, 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 it, if that's at all possible. Over the last 10 years or so, um, certainly with our juvenile populations, the County of Los Angeles has, has stopped for the most part, sending juveniles to the state. What was, what was formerly known as the California Youth Authority, now known as the Department of Juvenile Justice, over the last 10, 10 years or so, um, ju uh, juvenile judges in Los Angeles County and, and even our county department, county probation department, had pretty much stopped sending um, youth to that facility. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the, 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 the many reports that have come out about CYA and, and the, the negative impacts um, that, that that institution has had on juveniles within this within the state. Um, so uh, we, I think, at our at our height, had approximately 10,000 youth um, in this in the California Youth Authority. Um, I'd say a year ago, uh, two years ago, we had approximately 15, 1600. So over that 10-year span, um, with without realignment. Um, um, necessarily forcing us to, the county had already stopped sending our youth there. Um, and, and, and then there was a, a couple pieces of legislation actually passed about two years ago um, that actually 
did the same thing that AB 109, which is on the adult side, did is it, it gave supervision back to the local authority once an individual, once a juvenile goes to those institutions. Why I think that was, why I think LA took the position it did and, and it was a good thing is because it was based upon a premise that incarcerations and those facilities are for the most part artificial settings. We know that individuals who go away to prison, whether they're juveniles or adults, are eventually in one form or another going to be coming back to the local jurisdiction. Um, it, you, your, your best ability to, to rehabilitate, um, to provide services, uh, to wrap around services, to keep them connected to families, to family, faith-based organizations, et cetera, you probably have a better chance of doing that if the individual remains local. So to the degree that the individual can remain local, it makes probably more sense in terms of reducing recidivism, um, reducing those kinds of public safety risks, to keep them local and to, and to provide wraparound services that um, increase the likelihood of that individual remaining and mainstreaming back into the community. So with the, on the juvenile side, I think we saw that, um, and I think the county has worked um, in, in that vein. Um, on the adult side, it's been a little different. Um, I, I, I still think that the, the, our underlying, the underlying premise that um, you do a better job at the local level rehabilitating individuals is still the case on the adult side. The difficulty becomes um, when you don't have sufficient resources in order to provide those individuals with the kind of needs that they may have. One thing about the, the, the realignment population um, is that it tends to be, um, and I'm, I'm speaking somewhat anecdotally, um, it, it tends to be a younger population. Um, they're less criminally involved. Um, so they, 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 because they have served um, less time, on some, in some instances, less time in prison, um, they have some more stronger connections back to the local community. And as a result, um, they may be more amenable to rehabilitation. That's certainly our hope. Um, we, we um, the, on the county side, um, every month the, county, the county's probation department receives packets from the California Department of Rehabilitations on every individual that they'd like to release to us locally. Um, the county has the option to say yes or no to that individual based on their um, a review of, the, of, that, of that information. Um, and and as, as the, um, as the uh, assistant chief mentioned, um, a lot of, we, we don't get a chance to say no based on their previous criminal record. It's only the current charge that sent them to, state, to that state facility. Um, but there is still a belief that locally, um, our ability to provide them with services, to, to wrap ourselves around that individual, to connect them with faith space and community-based organizations will increase the likelihood of that individual not going to state prison, increase the individual, likelihood of that individual mainstreaming in our, in our local communities and becoming an asset as, as opposed to a deficit in, in those communities. It's still too early to, 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 to really say, um, but that is certainly our hope. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest issues with, with, with AB 109, and, and I think one of the previous panelists mentioned this, is the uncertainty of the, of the, of the finances. Um, our, our initial, the county's initial allotment of funds um, for this population was a little over $100 million, um, which may seem like a lot of money, but it, it really isn't um, when you boil it down, to, given the number of individuals we have to serve, the amount of money that, that has to go to law enforcement, that has to be provided to mental health services, for substance abuse services, for just um, general um, kind of uh, services that an individual, individual may need who's coming back from incarceration. Um, what we don't know, and, and, and the great uncertainty, is what's going to occur next fiscal year. Um, there's no money yet identified, um, for the most part, for, uh, for this population coming next year. And so our, our, our concern and our fear is that um, the governor um, and, 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 his, and his hope for constitutional amendment, will that happen? Um, and then is, will the county then be on the, uh, the hook um, for a, a, a mandated responsibility that it no, does not have the finances um, to, to, to take care of? Um, but I, I do believe that um, if sufficient revenue is provided, sufficient funds are provided at the local level, there is an opportunity for us to do a much better job of rehabilitating these individuals um, and mainstreaming these individuals and, and reducing recidivism and, and ensuring public safety uh, much more so than what, that, what, what we've seen has occurred at the state level. Um, so I'll end by saying that um, I am, I am I'm optimistic. I'm, 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 I'm slightly optimistic. Um, I, I think we need to see much more. Um, but I do believe that, that locally we have a, a great opportunity um, if we receive uh, sufficient resources to really make a, a, a difference in the lives of individuals who are certainly in our, in our justice systems. Thank you.
Thank you, Vincent. Shifting from a county perspective back to a city perspective, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Um, you know, I had a, a friend call me about a week ago, and they've been seeing all of the news reports about the, the fiscal strain that's been hitting cities, about the increasing difficulties of this realignment and redevelopment agencies. And he said, God, you know, how are you doing there at your job? And I'm, as, as we mentioned, I'm at the city of La Cunada, Flint Ridge, a small city, 22,000 uh, population, nestled between Pasadena and Glendale. And I started thinking about it. You know, it, it's almost like I'm, I'm looking out in one of those scenes somewhere else in the country where you're looking at a tornado and it's gone down a street and there's 10 homes and there's one left standing. And I feel like I'm in that one home that's been left standing. Um, so in a way, I've almost felt kind of guilty as I've been seeing what some of my colleagues and I think what the person here on my right is gonna, gonna talk about, about what their city has going, been going through. Uh, there may be something instructive in that, however, other than the fact that it just happens to be La Cunada Flint Ridge, a relatively affluent community. Um, and that, that's a, there's a couple things about it. One is, uh, it is a contract city. Um, roughly a third of the cities in the state of California are full service. They have their own police, fire, parks and rec, library. The other two thirds, most of them are contract cities. The city of La Cunada is a really strong form of that. Um, police, fire, public works, planning, building inspection, library, parks, all of those services are done by a separate level of government, typically Los Angeles County. Um, and whenever anything needs to be built in the city, the city pays for it, but it's essentially private contractors. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the, the, the winds of difficulty that are going through here, the, the city is not feeling those directly. And I have a feeling that that is the case with a lot of contract cities that are out there. Um, particularly for this, this wave of realignment that's happening. Um, for many cities, there has not been a lot that's been felt. A little bit, vehicle license fee revenue was, was reduced. Um, there have been state takings, if you will, that's what the cities have called them, of uh, some city revenues over the past few years. But other than that, in terms of real shifting of service responsibilities and real sort of uh, mandated or necessary changes in the services provided or the way they're delivered, uh, La Cunada and I have a feeling many other cities really have not felt much. That's the contract city portion. Here's the other portion. Um, right before February 1st, there were about 480 redevelopment agencies in the state of California, most of them associated with cities. The city of La Cunada Flint Ridge had its own redevelopment agency. The total amount of assets uh, with that agency was zero. No liabilities. It was created in 1983 and was just essentially a shell that never got used. So on February 1st, it died a very lonely, unnoticed death in the city. And I was sitting there watching my colleagues in many other cities, and you cannot believe the administrative confusion that was going on. Uh, little things because it was done so quickly. And this is aside from the merits of whether it was a good or bad policy decision. Um, setting up a bank account with LAIF, the local agency investment fund. Um, there was essentially a run on the, on, on the bank to get money withdrawn and then put into the name of these successor agencies because LAIF was telling these, these redevelopment agencies that they weren't going to allow any transfers of funds because they didn't recognize the agencies anymore. This kind of snuck up on a lot of these cities and they were all doing it say January 27th and 8th and 9th, it was just absolute, and I was, wa I was sitting there, as I often am at, at La Cunada Flint Ridge, relax, and watching what, what, these, <laughs> what these people were, were going through, and it, it was awful, it was awful, it was truly horrendous. So um, whatever and, and what you say about realignment, there's, there's an issue of process here that had to, had to be considered. Um, those two facts, however, with the city of La Cunada Flint Ridge, contract city, inactive redevelopment, really spared it to some extent from a lot of what everybody is going through, what you're gonna hear what somebody has been going through. 
Um, looking, looking forward, this is what a lot of the elected officials in the contract cities are talking about and what a lot of the discussion is about. Um, redevelopment for those agencies that, or those cities that had very active redevelopment agencies, um, it was alluded to earlier with the positions that were supported by redevelopment. It wasn't just redevelopment agency positions that were being supported by the tax increment, the property tax revenue that was being generated. It was, say, 50% of the city manager's position. It was 25% of the finance director's position. It was six planners. There is going to be an extraordinary amount of additional fiscal stress being put on cities as a result of redevelopment being dissolved. That revenue it was doing some wonderful work with redevelopment projects. It was also supporting a lot of day-to-day -day operations that a lot of these cities consider fixed. Um, council members in some places have 25, 50% of, of their often small salary, but nevertheless supported by a redevelopment agency. Those costs aren't going anywhere. Um, on the positive side from that, for those cities that have not really made use of redevelopment, um, an upside is that it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. Um, those who have not made use of that tool, particularly to try and get businesses to locate within their cities, have often felt disadvantaged because of that. And in that, in that sense, those, those, there may be some areas that feel like they have a little bit more of an advantage in the economic development realm than they did previously. Um, the second thing is what time and time again uh, I hear from elected officials, and I've heard it, it my, prior to, to La Cunada, I was the budget director at the city of Simi Valley, and prior to that, I was a consultant for financial matters to local governments, is what they really, really want is some additional political and legal ability to raise revenue locally. Um, now that, that is, as they say, a big issue with many trade-offs, as our first speaker wisely said. Um, but if, if they could do anything, and this would be fundamental to any realignment way down to the cities, um, to give them the opportunity to truly engage their citizens and say, look, we will do this if we can raise the revenue and you will hold us accountable for it. There are so many elected officials, there are so many people in local government who would love to have some of that, again, political and legal ability to do so. It gets to broader issues of Proposition 13. Um, the whole structure of, of local government revenue in California, it's not going to be happening anytime soon in this age of Bell, in this age of the $100,000 pension club. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, mistrust right now of local governments. That has to be resolved. But I think in time, um, if, if realignment is a serious idea, if people really believe in the power of local governments, particularly cities, to take responsibility for and be accountable for services, some additional ability to raise revenue locally has to be given. I'll end my talk there. Thank you very much. I think Dan forgot to mention that he's been a city man, city employee as long as Stephen, but because he's so relaxed, he looks a lot younger than Stephen. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Hi. <laughs> well, you know, there's a, a lot of things. She, she gives me these massive issues and say, oh, by the way, you got 10 minutes. And one's in redevelopment, one's going to be on Senate Bill 89, which I'm going to allude to here. And a lot of this is not getting into the mechanics, but I'm going to talk about some of the public policy issues that are related to both of these. But I want, I want to give you a couple little things why I'm kind of irritated being here. Number one, I just met Dan, and I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's what's called being jealous. I also, uh, I also have uh, one councilman that continually tells me, he says, you'll be all right, and I keep telling him, no, I won't. Um, but it, it's, these are huge public policy issues that we're faced with. Uh, I started my career in the mid-70s in the city of Norwalk, uh, pre-Prop 13. Uh, and of course, it's had no, uh, no effect on me at all. You can see Dan and I are the same age. <laughs> um, but I guess we need to select a proper city that we end up working for. 
But the two issues that I want to go through here um, really has huge issues. Uh, a lot of it was alluded to by, uh, by Dean from the PPIC, which I think is one of the best resources of information, nonpartisan information in the state of California. And uh, Dean, you're, you're to be commended to be involved with that. But a, a couple of things. Um, let's talk about redevelopment first. Uh, redevelopment, and, uh, and forgive me because I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. I've tried to jot down all these notes this morning. Uh, it, to me, it's an object lesson of the powers of the state, powers of the state of California. In our federal system, the states are sovereign, but cities and counties are not. In California, as elsewhere, they are mere creatures of the state and exist only at the state's sufferance. 1992, State of California Supreme Court decision. It's amazing how many cities, I think deep down, and I'm not talking about just the community, I'm talking about professionals, I don't think deep down really understood that. I think many cities have acted like that they've had the same sovereign relationship with the state as the states have with the federal government. I think that's true, and, and, and maybe we need to go back to basic civics. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a criticism. So let's talk about redevelopment, and let's talk about how redevelopment became a target and why, it, uh, why uh, for many reasons, but part of it, as you know, it's money. And, uh, and I'll, I'll quote one of my favorite philosophers from the recent past, Daffy Duck, <laughs> that it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you get the money. <laughs> and that's kind of what we were dealing with here to some extent. So redevelopment goes back to 1945. Uh, it was really established to do one major thing, eliminate blight, blighting conditions. Uh, what people have uh, used to call slums, and it came on the heels of some of the urban programs, federal urban programs of renewal, which a lot of you know. Um, later on in the 70s, there was a special provision, as we most of us know, to uh, provide uh, affordable housing. I think it was the Montoya legislation in the late 70s that mandated the redevelopment agencies be involved in the creation uh, and uh, development of affordable housing opportunities. What it ended up doing was, and what you would hope it would do in blighted conditions, uh, and oh, by the way, even though it was established in 45, it really didn't have any financial methodology with tax increment until like 1952, where it actually had the ability to finance some of these things, is to induce a private sector to invest in areas that where the risk is perceived to be too high. I can't get my return on investment as part of the private sector in a particular area because there's just too many risks. There's no market depth, there's not enough buying power, uh, it could be the perceptions of crime, whatever the case might be, it's just a tough nut and I'm not going there without some assistance from the public sector and that's one of the major reasons that redevelopment was created. So what happens? And we alluded to the sacred Prop 13 and uh, Dean, you, you certainly know this term better than anyone, that really started the fiscalization of land use because it really did. Cities had to get into the position of replacing significant percentages of loss of revenue, namely the loss of property tax, when property tax was reduced to 1% of assessed valuation. And cities got into the business of what they called economic development, and this is just my, my, my opinion, where in fact it mostly was fiscal development, which is not a bad thing. It was fiscal development to continue to provide adequate resources, do the basic services for police, fire services, all the things that we know, where we, by and large, had to go after the next largest revenue source on average, which was sales tax. So you see cities fighting on average for uh, shopping centers and the next Costco and the next auto dealer, et cetera, et cetera, as you all know. And I remember writing articles in the CRA report back in the 80s that said you hadn't cut your teeth unless you'd done a mall or you'd done a hotel transaction. Um, and that's what we were calling as good redevelopment and economic development activities. Now, that's not to say that cities don't do good economic development, which by and large is wealth creation for the individuals that live there. What do you do to induce, to help the private sector invest, it creates jobs, it creates wealth, assists in the development of, of the creation of businesses and, uh, and opportunity. So, when in fact, um, Redevelopment agencies were getting too successful in a lot of things, and the assessed valuations were going up through the ceiling due to their efforts in many instances, or, or were lucky enough to be able to induce private sector development to occur in redevelopment project areas that had nothing to do with the inducement. It just happened because 
the synergy was started, the synergy was getting to move forward in a particular area. Well, because property tax was frozen, a base was frozen for the taxing entities, namely school districts and counties, those incremental growth dollars obviously went to the redevelopment agency. Well, this started pitting RDAs against counties and school districts. Uh, and the battle was kind of on. And, and there was a lot of effort, both at the state level and county levels, to start retracting, bringing back the ability of redevelopment agencies to conduct redevelopment, especially when it came to big box users, uh, auto dealers, all those kinds of things that, that you've heard about before. State began to reduce the powers of agencies over the last 20, 25 years, primarily reduced powers, uh, RE, uh, non-housing activities, and then the AB 1290-1994, which is the tightening up the definition of blight. Years and years ago, if a piece of property was vacant, it was blighted because it was considered economically blighted. You could ask the city of Cerritos. I think the whole city was a redevelopment project area. Uh, yep, that cow over there is blighted. So um, you can see where agencies would actually set the stage to end up over time being set up for their own successes as being questionable activities. You could see this, this whole, this whole litany of activities against redevelopment was really getting staged and set up over a number of years. It just didn't happen over the last couple of years. Uh, we alluded to Prop 98 in 1992 with the first ERAF shift, you know, to, uh, to assist the state in its, uh, its obligation in sitting, uh, uh, to assisting school districts, the Educational, uh, educational uh, Relief Augmentation Fund. Uh, it shifted basically $2 billion to the state at that time. About in 09, with the $1.7 billion shift, the second year raft, away from, primarily from redevelopment agencies, in 2010, 11, another $350 million, which, uh, which is the Prop 1A issue. Um, you can see where the state raids were going, and you can see why like, local government was getting real concerned with all this money shifting upwards and nothing coming back. So the movement kept on going up and up and up as far as shifting dollars. So. Prop 22, successful, uh, pushed by the League of California Cities to basically prevent further raids on local government uh, funding. You think that was the cap that was going to stop these raids and the dollars are going back north. Well, so what happens? Uh, I'm going to use my own words. You can imagine the conversation in the governor's office. Fine, we'll just do away with redevelopment agencies. What do you think of that? Boy, you talk about power. And the way we responded to it, uh, I have to say, the state of California was brilliant how they set this up. Absolutely brilliant. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly they had the constitutional authority to deal with this. Now, granted, the damage is off the scale how we're going to deal with this. It was the successor agencies, the, the legality of individual uh, transactions that were uh, midway through, what happens with bond issues, what about defeasements, and on and on and on and on, let alone are the very pragmatic issues uh, uh, that the Assistant Chief of Long Beach addressed, uh, not even withstanding the very pragmatic issues of that, you have all these very mechanical and legal issues, in my opinion, is going to take years to deal with. So AB 26 is upheld by the, the Supreme Court and the constitutionality of what the state was doing to, uh, to eliminate redevelopment occurs. And uh, like Dan was saying, I, there are numerous cities that were not prepared for that decision. They just weren't. I don't know if they thought this was in the bag, we were going to win it, uh, but the issues go way beyond just the staffing issues that was alluded to before, the direct people in housing and redevelopment, economic development issues. It's that percentage of the manager, that percentage of the finance director, the planners, the code enforcement officers, et cetera, et cetera. So now one thing when we talk about pushing down responsibility, uh, which is kind of the, 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 the concept of what's been going on like with realignment, that was never the case in redevelopment. Redevelopment is local. Redevelopment is local generation. This is to eliminate local blighting conditions, not state issues. And yet at the last session we had back at Claremont, if you recall, remember we had the ledge analyst mm -hmm. office? absolutely floored me. Her response to all this was, well, it's all those local efforts that are supposed to make the state more solvent and a better economic place in general. What are you doing to do that? I think it was something like that that she said. <laughs> they couldn't measure, they said they couldn't measure the economic benefit at the state level there of what are. the redevelopment agencies were doing. There you are. That's exactly right. And of course, after we all pick ourselves up off the floor and going, huh? 
it, 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 I mean, you can just see where this lack of communication and lack of understanding is really, really happening. So let me get to the next issue, though. I, I hate to shift away from redevelopment. You can talk about redevelopment, ramifications of redevelopment, whether it's good, bad, and different, good examples, bad examples, and we could spend the entire hour and a half just talking about that. And let me talk about something that's very near and dear, and I think it's even a larger public policy issue myself. Uh, as, as you know, I'm the city manager in the newest city in the state of California. We're fortunate enough here to have three, uh, three members, uh, the mayor and two council members of the city of Harupa Valley, the newest city uh, in the state. Um, they did everything they were supposed to do. You do the, the, the uh, fiscal analysis. It shows the city can be solvent, can stand on its own two feet. You go through the, the local agency formation commission approval process through the Cortese Knox Act. You do all of those things that you're supposed to do. You take the, 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 the question to the voters, they approve it, and two days before we open our doors, two days before we open our doors, Senate Bill 89 passes, which removes in our first year 40% of our revenues before we even open up our doors. So you wonder why I'm a recovering city manager? <laughs> uh, they were wondering why that case of vodka was in my office. <laughs> I blame it on somebody else. But the, the long and the short of it, when you, when you look at the state numbers, SB 89 shifted motor vehicle lieu fees north, shall we say, to Sacramento to be realigned back down to deal with, with public safety issues and the realignment. This was a whole $130 million, which is about as nominal an amount to the state budget as you can imagine, $130 million. Well, what it meant to the city of Harupa Valley was $7 million out of, a first, out, of, uh, out of a projected second year budget of $22 million, so roughly a third for our next operational uh, uh, year. If we do not get restitution of this, or in fact the city council decides not to make major cuts, especially to public safety, we will be insolvent in 18 months. Insolvent. I can't even file for bankruptcy because we don't know anybody any money. What kind of protection do we have? So when a state government does an act like this, now granted, what they did to redevelopment was very direct and very purposeful. I would like to think this was not purposeful. I would like to think this was uh, collateral damage and something they didn't truly understand because what it did was specifically injure newly incorporated cities post-2004 which the majority of our revenues are dependent upon motor vehicle lieu fees because we don't get the property tax that everybody else gets. So there's two classes of cities, have and have nots. And it's easy for just four cities in the state of California to be ignored. You know, Dan, you know, over at the spa, you know, having a good time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I use that same remark that I'm going to the spa. If, uh, you're really a good guy putting up with this. <laughs> so, the, so here we are with $130 million shift, $7 million out of, out of our coffers. Um, vote of the people, do everything right. So now we're looking at proposed legislative fixes. And we're dealing with the partisanship that we're all well aware of in the state and the partisanship we're well aware of on the national level. We hear it every single day whether you're engaged in uh, civic affairs or not. And we have two, there's two proposed pieces of legislation going through right now. One would hopefully restore the, uh, the VLF that was taken from, from the four cities. The other one would deal more with the property tax issue. Uh, I have to tell you, we have had a meeting in the governor's office with his staff. You know, if, you're, uh, if they're really just trying to put up with you, you got a 10 to 15 minute meeting. We had an hour meeting. And they clearly understand that, you know, this probably was a collateral damage issue that we didn't recognize. But how do you fix it? How do you fix it? I mean, we, we, we met with Anna Montesanos, as you know, as the uh, Director of Finance of the State of California, and she says, what pot do I take it from? Because even it's only $130 million, in your case, with the four cities, only $16 million, where do I take it from? So we're dealing with all those issues right now. But I think what gets missed here and for, for the students and the academics in the room may, may have interest in this. Um, there's two professors, David Miller uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and Raymond Cox from the University of Akron that wrote a, uh, um, a small essay, 30-page essay regarding the relationships of government and regional agencies, but it's very applicable here. 
And what they, what they talk about is representative form of governments versus uh, uh, the legality of governments. And what they call the unresolved and necessary tension between legal and political cultures. And what that means is, is that you're dealing with the legality of the formations of cities, but you're also talking about the political culture and the right of individuals to associate any which way, shape, or form which is constitutionally protected at the federal level. And so many times that is completely ignored and it's this balancing act that happens with our, our need for home rule. Um, and maybe it's a romantic ideal, a Jeffersonian ideal of home rule. But it's very real and, 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 and very important is how you balance that with, uh, with the legality. So reframing the political and legal relationship between uh, local governments and regional institutions is, is, is the text on this. The state's legal uh, authority, citizens' rights of association. So let me just finish here where we're still trying to do this. No, oh, by the way, as far as contracts, we are 100% contract city. Cedar Hoopa Valley does not have a single employee. We have four um, consulting groups that provide all of the service. There are no employees. This is a city that's in a position that can't hire employees until they know whether they're going to be here in the next 18 months. So we have four firms that provide all of the service, which also includes our, our legal services. But let me close with uh, uh, kind of an older version of the statement I made from the uh, uh, state Supreme Court. This goes back to what everybody know, knows, and I'm sure the academics here in the room, room knows, Dillon's Rule. Dillon's Rule, Justice John Dillon of Iowa, 1868, talking about the relationships between cities uh, and their states. Local governments are mere tenants at will of their respective state legislatures and could be limited by the legislature with a stroke of the pen, 1868. So I think we're going to have to figure out different ways from a civic discussion and hopefully it's, it's some balance between policy and politics where we can figure out a better way of how to resolve these particular issues of local government and state government. Um, it's easy for me to say that sitting up here and wearing an academic hat. Uh, I'm also an adjunct. I'm not sure what that means since the negative comment. <laughs> Jeez. I'm an adjunct at uh, Northwestern. I'm an adjunct at uh, the University of Laverne. I guess that makes me doubly worse. <laughs> But um, I think the issue really gets down to, we're, we're in a, a position, can we, can we deal with smaller organizations that really don't have the luxury of getting beyond day-to-day -day implementation activities because they're under such guns with such, such restricted resources? And the state of California has done everything it could do to eliminate local government's ability to generate resources. How do we change that? How do we have true open conversations with civic dis discourse? And I think that's our challenge. Uh, so with that, uh, I guess we'll go and do some. Thank you, Stephen. Before we get to questions, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. I just wanted to state for the record that I'm not related to that Dylan. <laughs> At least not that I'm aware of. So um, we're happy to entertain questions. We have a microphone up here at the front of the room in front of the podium. Unless you have a really loud, booming voice, it would help the rest of the audience if you wouldn't mind coming up to ask your question of the panel. Come on up. Um, I, I should qualify my biases before I ask my question. I'm a student of Professor Jordan's, um, and he's a wonderful professor. I used to live in Long Beach. Um, used I used to be a criminal defense attorney before <laughs> here, so. Um, and you're tall, so I'm you tall, have to cook up my voice is not very loud. <laughs> so I'll try again. That's better. Okay, so this has been really, really exciting to hear each of you. Um, and my question is, um, there has been a lot of discussion in the past few months about the realignment in the criminal justice system, about the realignment with uh, regard to community redevelopment. Um, I went to a conference in DC. Um, the ABA had a sentencing and reentry institute where they talked about the pressures on local government, police departments, um, to try and fund reentry programs. Um, is, is California able to tap into federal funds um, for reentry programs so that the burden isn't on the police department? That's the first question. Um, there's a federal program. There's also, I think, in the budget for California, there was $2.6 billion for reentry programs and construction. 
So I guess the sub question is, can the local jurisdictions access those funds or are they closed off to us now? And then the final question is, um, why is it that Long Beach Police Department has the burden of m dealing with reentry um, in Brooklyn? There's a DA's office who has that burden. So I just wonder why. Thank you. Very good questions. Thank you. Who would like to address them? Well, sure. I, I think part of the question was some of the federal funding um, around issues issues of reentry and certainly certainly um, cities and our counties have an opportunity to apply for some funding um, I, some of it is um, a block grant funding so and it, it, it may be previously allocated so it's, it's it would be very difficult to state depending on the specific funding source um, so a lot of the state funding uh, in terms of capital projects dollars that have come down are are for just that capital projects. So there's, there, there is funding on the table for the county and or some cities to build new facilities. That is not necessarily the route that everyone wants to go or uh, that is not philosophically the way in which some people believe that reentry should be done going forward. And so there's been a lot of hesitancy, certainly on the part of the Board of Supervisors of LA County to go that direction. Um, we, we, some of our facilities are very old and they, they probably need to be rehabbed and et cetera. But there's a larger issue of how do we want to do reentry going forward and does it make sense to spend a lot of our monies on, on facilities to house individuals as opposed to uh, finding more um, therapeutic rehabilitative um, um, applications that we could actually apply to individuals. That's a shot at that part of the question. Yeah, and I'd echo what um, Vincent just said. We uh, are always going after grant funding and able to support different programs like that, so we'll continue to do that. Um, we're very good at doing that. We'll continue. We have a, um, a couple uh, employees dedicated in our fiscal division that do that. And then your other question was why is it our responsibility at the municipal level uh, regarding reentry? And you said DC had a DA's office Brooklyn. Uh, response? Brooklyn. It's uh, in County, New York. Uh, New York. Oh, yeah. And basically, we could sit back. We could sit back and just let it happen. Um, but I think that's part of the responsibility we have to our community and to the 500,000 people that we serve on a daily basis. If we were to sit idly by and just let reentry happen and not take initiative and try to um, join with our law enforcement partners and social service partners to make those, re those wraparound services um, more robust and have that connectivity. There's nothing like a police officer checking up on you every day saying, did you take your meds? Are you going to work today? What can I do to help you? I mean, literally, that is what they are doing um, with the assistance of social services and other wraparound services. So yes, we could sit back and not participate. But I think that's a good investment on our part in, in what we're doing to prevent future crime and make a productive citizen. Could I add to that? Um, uh, this is sort of a nerdy addition, but <laughs> the, the question was a little nerdy, you have to admit. <laughs> um, when uh, the Department of Finance was developing the financial plan for correctional realignment, they had a model. They had a spreadsheet to so many prisoners to each county. Um, they uh, calculated a certain amount of money for the costs of jail and of policing for these folks. And then they had a separate pot of money for programs to rehabilitate these folks. And then there was a separate pot of money for DAs and, uh, and court costs. Okay, now the, the money for jails and the money for rehabilitation was all put together into one big pot, and then the counties figured out how to allocate it among the counties. So there's no guarantee that the money that was originally intended for rehabilitation will be available for that purpose. That's up to each county. Now, I've been trying to follow this. It's very hard to know what's actually going on because it's 58 counties, everybody doing something different, right? Uh, but what I, uh, what I think is happening is that some counties are spending virtually all the money putting people in jail. They're putting these state, formerly state prisoners, or would have been state prisoners in jail. And others, the lib counties, uh, are trying to spend a fair amount of money on uh, rehabilitation programs. Uh, and, uh, and it varies all over the state. 
And so, to me, one of the most intriguing things here is to try to figure out which county is doing what and what are the consequences. Because if we knew that, we'd know something really important. But nobody's doing that right now. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> um, I'm a student at, at Soul Price. Um, I just want to say thank you again for coming. And um, you know, listening to all this, it sounds very bleak. Um, you know, this is these are big problems that we all clearly touch all of our communities in a lot of different ways. So, assuming that the state of California isn't evil, what exactly is the vision? Like, what what is what? I didn't assume they just kind of yanked all this funding and was like, figure it out. So, if you could speak to sort of the uh, at least conceptual fixes that they had built in, that'd be interesting. Well, can I start with that? Sure. Well, the, the, the state actually had uh, a very optimistic um, conception. Uh, it, and I'm th talking particularly about corrections, since it's the biggest part of this. They had the idea that, uh, first of all, that state prisons weren't all that good for people. Uh, the, the recidivism rate was spectacular. Uh, the rehabilit rehabilitation programming in state prisons is virtually nil, particularly for these non-non-non-lower-level uh, offenders. So the state wasn't doing much. That's not a hard act to compete with. The hope was that counties would uh, respond to these people, first of all, with a deeper sense of commitment, because they're going to, to their, they're going to the counties. They're going to the local communities. The locals have a bigger stake than some state prison guard. Second, the counties run the programs that the prisoners need. The prisoners tend to need drug and alcohol programs. They tend to need education, which the counties don't directly run. They tend to need housing. They tend to need jobs. Uh, they may need medical care. They may need a lot of things. They may need anger management. They may need a lot of things that, in theory, they can get through county programs. So the hope was that the counties would kind of be holistic about this and provide these services to these incoming non-non-nons and uh, do a better job, have a lower recidivism rate, have these people kind of adopt a normal career path rather than uh, a criminal one. That's the, that's the fantasy. And uh, I'm pretty sure that in some counties that's going to work that way and in others, not so much. Anybody else want to add to that? I was just thinking one other thing that might be worth mentioning is that the, um, I think the state was also not real thrilled with the idea of the federal courts taking over this, <laughs> the, uh, the California Department of Corrections. And I think that was a motivator sure. for pushing folk back locally and, and, and reducing their prison population numbers. And um, I think that that's worth mentioning as well. Sure. <clears throat> We're about out of time, but we can entertain one more question, if we have any. Sure. My name is Ed Sykes. I'm actually uh, a supervising deputy probation officer assigned to the LA County Chief Executive Office working with Vincent Holmes. My question was to anybody on the panel, um, we're working on a lot of reentry efforts on the juvenile level, not so much on the adult level, and we, we found some, some pretty good positive outcomes. but. I wanted to ask, was there any component or any discussion or focus put on transition? We talk about resources in the community, but was there any focus or any energy put into transition from state to local? I think that's, the, the resources are there in some cases, but the transition piece, was there any discussion on how the state prisoners were going to be transitioned back to the community? Or was there any funding included in the transition piece? Anybody have an answer? <laughs> we could have talked about this online. <laughs> uh, but I, but I, I mean, I think one thing, that, one thing that's worth mentioning is that I think the, Again, this, I think the state was under some significant um, burdens and it, it needed to get it, its prison population numbers down. I think the state's major concern was reducing prison population and I think there, it was a handoff. And, and I, I don't think that the state gave a lot of uh, consideration to 
um, making that a warm handoff and, and, and making that transition um, a, a, bit, a bit more uh, smoother either for um, the, 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 um, the governmental entities that would be responsible for superv supervising that individual or for the community partners who would be responsible for providing resources. So I, I don't, I, I, I'm not convinced that the state gave it that much thought. I think, I think that they were, there were some other issues that they had to deal with that were a lot more press, um, uh, um, more important. Um, and, and, and I think that was where, that was the impetus for, for how they moved. Well, uh, a different way of answering the question is at the, uh, the level of the, the nerdy folks who designed the, the, the financing package for correctional realignment, they were thinking about transition and as I said, they set aside a pot of money to pay for rehabilitation programs, which is part of transition. Um, but then the jail money and the rehabilitation money got put into one big pot. Now, the state could have said, okay, we're gonna hand this out to the counties and we're gonna set aside a certain amount of money for uh, the jails and the cops and a certain amount of money for rehabilitation. But that isn't what the state did. Instead, they said, here's the pot. We don't wanna get in the middle of this. CSAC, the counties, go figure out how to divide this up. I'm told that it took about three weeks longer than it should have because of Los Angeles County, but that's just a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the, the money isn't segregated into jails and courts and rehabilitation, it's just one pot. And then it went to each county, and each county can decide how much they want to spend with cops, how much they want to spend with, uh, with rehabilitation. They can do either. Uh, but, you know, that's realignment. If you really believe in giving authority to the locals, you've got to give authority to the locals. Thank you. Well, please, we have one more. Everyone want to go for one more question? Okay. Come on up. Hi. I'm Jen Connolly. I'm a Ph.D. student here at the Price School. Um, and my question is, with the state government shifting some responsibility to the local level but not necessarily backing that up with the appropriate funding, has this created a push at the local level to try to innovate or use technology to increase efficiency, meaning you know, be able to provide the same level of service and the same quality of service, but somehow at a cheaper cost. Um, I don't know if that would be through technology. Um, for example, with the, you, you mentioned a police officer checking in with people to make sure they're going to their job. You know, if you have some sort of program where they can do that online or with the cell phone, or I just was wondering if there's been a push to try to increase efficiency or to innovate so that you don't have to cut services or decrease the quality and the level of the services that you provide. First, they'd have that internet service, which most of them would not have. A lot do have phones, but they're pay-as-you-go phones, which would be problematic if they didn't pay as they went. And then um, the other piece of that is with the GPS tracking devices on their ankles that they're allowed now, if the county can't provide housing for them at the county level, they can then uh, serve their time in their home with a GPS device. But then again, that still requires someone to monitor them and make sure they're where they're supposed to be kind of thing. So that's the technology piece they're looking at. Um, but do, no matter how many cameras we put or how much technology we use, nothing will ever replace face-to-face -face interaction between people. That's what truly instills change in people. And in time and time again, that's what we see. Anyone else want to respond to that question? Well, the, 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 the cities are always doing that. Cities, uh, cities, most cities will try to use every kind of technology they can if it's not budget restrictive. If it gets down to hiring a police officer versus some technological issue, just the normal demands in a community will probably say, let's hire another police officer normally. So I think that's, that's relatively standard. I think what you're seeing, though, is a revisitation, uh, like was discussed both with La Cañada Flint Ridge um, and our own city, is, is contracting and public, not just the overused term of public-private partnerships, but public-public partnerships. You know, are you, are you dealing uh, with service deliveries that can be better provided by another entity for, for a lesser rate? Uh, the reason these contract cities uh, are in Los Angeles County today is because of contracting with, with LA, LA Sheriff and, uh, and Fire. That's why most of the cities were able to survive because they could never have put together the capital for all the uh, infrastructure that would be needed to run both of those agencies. So you're gonna see a revisitation in those things. 
A uh, good example, too, would be the city of Brea and I think the city of La Habra that actually share a fire chief as an example. So it's not just technology. Uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of shared services. Uh, uh, and you're going to see people, uh, I think, have to look at sharing authority and power, which is probably even a bigger issue than that. Yes, and, and even more mundane, this isn't, it does get to efficiency, and um, there, there, is, there is a lot of cost shifting going on right now. Remember, local governments are very labor intensive entities. Uh, depending on the city, 60, 70, 80 percent of the total general fund costs are personnel. So if you're talking about, you can do, you can do a couple of things. You can either make uh, each person less expensive, uh, you can have fewer people, or you can try to make some kind of technology effic efficiencies. Right, right now, the emphasis is on, uh, frankly, number one, is just getting some of these benefit costs down because whether you think they're fair, whatever you think about it, they've just gotten so out of line with what people in the, in the rest of the economy are getting, they just become politically unsustainable and now they're fiscally unsustainable un increasingly. Um, that's a major effort. There, there's, not a, there's not a city local government that's not looking at those closely right now. Well, I'd like to wrap up by first thanking you for being such a wonderful audience and for asking such good questions and paying such good attention. We really appreciate your attention to this. And I want to also thank the panel members for doing such an excellent job today, giving you different perspectives from their different jurisdictions. And these are just a tiny little insight into just a fragment of the issues that they deal with on a daily basis. Um, and I, for one, learned a lot today. And I think there's a lot more to learn. And I think um, we're going to be all in this together since we all live here and we enjoy California. We want to, California to be the best state there is. I'll just make one pitch for ASPA. And that is, for those of you that are in school right now and you're not sure what you're going to do with your career, there's more and more information coming out that fewer and fewer people are going to choose to go into public service based on the state of information that comes out about being a public servant. And I just want you to, to really think seriously about choosing a career in government and public service. And the main point is that there is no end to the number of challenges that you have. <laughs> and, and if you like pro solving problems and you really enjoy stretching your creativity, you will really enjoy working in public service. <laughs> And, and I'm, not, I'm not joking, although you can laugh about it, because we all, I'm sure, have wonderful stories to tell. Um, but you also meet some amazing people who really, really want to do the right thing. And there are so many out there like that. So when you read the papers and you only read about the folks that are up to no good, there's people up to no good in every profession. But for some reason, we're really highlighting the ones in public service right now. But there's so many good, amazing people. And Dan, who's the head of the Bedrosian Center, was um, telling us a story about Saul Price. And you could probably spend a session just talking about what a great example he is in terms of a private sector business person who is giving back to the community to make this area a, a better place. So you all have that opportunity to do that. I also want to, on a sustainable note, say we didn't hand out anything to you from ASPO because we're trying to be sustainable and save paper. But our website is up here on our banner. And we have three more events this year, um, two coming up, uh, two student professional dinners, one in February, which Stacy Mungo, our past president, is here in the audience. Stacy, do you want to come up and mention that real quick? Thank you all for being here today. And thank you to Debbie, our fearless president, for all the partnerships. For those of you who don't know, we used to be the LA Metro chapter. And a few years ago, the, the national organization said, LA Metro is doing such an exceptional job, we'd be more than happy to give you all of Southern California. So we have swallowed the Orange County chapter and another smaller chapter adjacent to Orange County and the northern part of San Diego. So what we're doing is we're reaching out and we're hosting events more south. So our next event is being hosted in partnership with the Long Beach Police Department, one of our board members, um, Michael Beckman, the Commander Beckman, is helping us host at the Long Beach Community Hospital. It's on February 22nd, and we'll be speaking with Tom Madaka. He works in the city manager's office, and he is a very bright individual from the USC network who works on legislation from the city perspective. But as times have gotten tighter, 
his job has gotten wider. So he doesn't just do legislation anymore. It will be an excellent opportunity for really face-to-face, one-on-one, up-close discussions. It'll be catered by one of, I'll keep it a secret, one of our Long Beach local favorites. So please join us. Thanks, Stacey. Last thing real quick is we have an annual uh, awards banquet in June and um, we actually give out some really prestigious awards to very deserving people. And so nomination periods open. If you know a professor or an organization or a um, um, group of people that have done some outstanding work either in the public sector or in the nonprofit sector, we welcome you to nominate somebody. Um, you can actually go to our website and get the information there online. So with that, um, is Aubrey still here? Looks like Aubrey. Aubrey, okay, Aubrey. she is, okay. Well, Aubrey's the beautiful young lady that was checking you in with the short hair and she's responsible for putting together these events. So I wanted to thank her and if you could thank her on our behalf, she does an amazing job um, and she's the one behind the scenes because ASPA has no staff, we're all volunteers. So when we put something together like this, we rely on the Bedrosian Center and whoever we're working with to really do all the logistics and she really does a great job. So thank you, have a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you soon.